<laughs> okay. If you haven't had a chance to sign in, there's a paper over here. We can start uh, moving that around. Um, tonight is the last of the teaching classes. Um, we will not meet next week because it's Memorial Day, but we will meet on the following Monday, which is June 3rd, I thought. Third, June 3rd. And that is the, uh, that's where, you know, we invite you to bring food for everybody, you know, something that you like, you would like to share with people. Um, just whatever you want to bring. It's not required, not required to be here. But if you want to bring something to uh, share with everybody, that would be a blessing. Um, and then, uh, oh, you can pass the paper around so that it's got to be um, Then I am praying over some possibilities for some things going on this summer um, with the wedding that the with the wedding of our nephew coming up, uh, there's been a lot going on. So Sorry. I've been trying to hear from the Lord what to do about that. But uh, stay tuned for that. I will be sending out emails when I get it, unless I find out something before the next time we meet. Um, be in prayer for, uh, again, I'd ask you to be in prayer for the book. Um, I'm now... I just received it back from the editor, so now it's my turn to go through and review it and wow. do the edits. And uh, one answer to prayer that some of you know, others don't, is that the Lord provided a gift, a donation that covers the call, all the entire calls for the publication. Praise so God. That's been taken care of by His grace. Amen. So I don't know who it was. It just Praise God. Okay, so. so when is it going to be out this year? <laughs> I they said the process I'm in now could take 60 to 90 days. So Praise God. After that, it's probably another month of copy editing. and I mean, the, the cover editing and stuff like that. So possibly before the end of the summer, maybe by September. So we will just keep it in prayer. It's a long process. So it's, it's hard. <laughs> so, it's already done. We are going to see what the Lord does. What is the name of that book? The the <laughs> Life and Calling of the Intercessor. Oh. It's the intercession book the Lord wanted me to do first. Yeah. Um, yeah. And very uh, very timely that the Lord wants that particular thing. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, okay. Let's uh, get started tonight. Let me uh, let me just start with a. Uh, <laughs> no, let's let's just get started. Let's uh, go before the Lord. Again, if you have questions and stuff, that's what the, the June third, the, the last Monday is for. Um, I don't know if that's what the Lord's going to do that Monday, but <laughs> plan to bring your questions then, and we'll see what God has in store for that. So let's just go before the Lord in prayer. And, Ask him to lead us tonight in, in our time. Oh, Father, we just come before you and we thank you, Lord, for just your great grace that brings us to this point and allows us to enter into your presence. To continuously hear from you. To 
to know you. Father, I just ask that you move tonight among us. Change us, Lord. Soften our hearts to be made into the image of the one who lives inside of us. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would come and be our teacher, that you would convict us of every, every detail of our lives that is of our own understanding, every thought, every motive, every desire that comes out of our understanding and not from the heart of Father. Realign us, change us. Lord, you said in the beginning of this year that you were changing and maturing us. God, have your heart's desire in us tonight. Make us over, Lord. I ask that you would come in all of your presence, all of your power, all of your might. And that you would cause our minds, our hearts, our souls, and our spirit to conform to your own. Father, I ask that you would open up our eyes to see you on the throne. I ask for supernatural revelation to all who hear tonight. But Lord, we may walk away knowing the reality of that statement, that you are Lord. Break our hearts with that understanding, God. Prepare us for what you see in front of us. Lord, we are your people. We are the sheep of your pasture. Make us, Lord, into those who walk and live that way. Free us from our sin, from our own understanding that holds us back and causes us to walk not in your ways, but in the ways of this world. Calls us to rise up, O oh Lord. To rise up as the people of the living God. To rise up in unity. Unity with Christ and oneness with each other. That truly 
your kingdom will come on this earth and your will will be done as you've already pronounced it so in heaven. Make us your people, Lord. Break into our understanding with the reality of your holiness, of your sovereignty, of what it means to be the people of the living God. Father, I ask that you would keep from this room every spirit that the enemy would send to cause distraction. That you would keep out everything that would tear our minds and our hearts and our spirits away from your throne, away from hearing you. Make this an incubation place tonight where you grow us fast for what is about to come, Lord, that we may stand, that we may stand firm in who we are in Christ and in who you are on the throne. So, Lord, I just commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we are continuing to look in Deuteronomy and remember <coughs> as we remember where we are chronologically, God has brought the people of Israel out of captivity, out of slavery, out of Egypt, and is bringing them, again, if you haven't signed in, if you can sign in so we know that you're here. Um, God has been, God brought them through 40 years in the desert because of their rebellion. And he has caused an entire generation to die in the desert because they refused to believe him. They refused to have faith in him. They refused to trust him and they rebelled against him. And the rebellion was a rebellion of a lack of faith in God. So that generation has died off. The um, the high priest, the first high priest, Aaron, has died. Miriam, who was the sister of Moses, has died. Now you have three people left from that generation that came out of Egypt. Moses, who was about to die, um, Caleb, and Joshua. And God, God has laid it on the heart of Moses <coughs> to re-instruct, to give again his law to his people, this new generation, as they prepare to enter, to cross over the Jordan and enter into the land of promise, into the place that he has said that they, that is going to be theirs, that they're going to take. And he has been emphasizing over and over the importance of obeying him. When you enter into your land of blessing, the place that God said, I'm going to establish you, he says, remember to obey. Him. And that is so important. When you're in difficulty, when you're in trial, when you're in the desert, it's a little bit easier to cry out to the Lord, to look to the Lord, because you ain't got nothing but you. When you're in the desert, you have no help. There's no food around. There's very The only way you're going to know where the water is is if God takes you there, <laughs> especially a desert like the Sinai Desert. It's, it's vast. It's huge. It is blazing hot, and it is difficult. But when you enter into a land where everything is provided for you, and remember, God said, I'm not giving you a land like, you know, that's never been settled or inhabited. I'm giving you everything prepared. I'm giving you a land and a nation that in, in modern day terms, it's turnkey. You just got to walk in and sit down and settle. 
You have no repairs to make. You've got nothing that you need to do other than to get rid of the inhabitants that are a stench to me because of their disobedience to me. Now, again, one of the things God is reemphasizing to the people of Israel is who he is. He's establishing himself as the Lord, the king, the ruler of Israel. And he says, as you prepare to go into the land, remember who I am. Because, and he says, this isn't about you. You're receiving this land has got nothing to do with you. It has to do with the disobedience of the people that I originally set up in this land. They so disobeyed me. They so went contrary to my law that I am rejecting them and pushing them out of this land. The land itself is vomiting them out. And I'm simply bringing you in as the new caretakers. But the difference is you are my people. I have established my presence among you. I am living with you. I tabernacle with you. In fact, it's, it, it, that's the word that you use for my tent is the tabernacle the place of dwelling. I live among you, the Lord says. So be careful when you get established in the place of dwelling, in the dwelling, the place of blessing, that you do not forget the one who is your king. Because the king is going to establish his throne in a particular place in this land. And when you get established in that land, some of you will live very, very far from the king's throne. Others will live a lot closer. And there's a way that you live within the land that you still have to bring your tithes. You still have to bring your offerings. You still need to honor our, my feast. You still need to obey my laws. And the Lord said, these are the laws that I've given you. And he said, don't add to them. Don't take away from them. These are the laws. If you live by what I'm telling you, you will be prosperous. If you do what I tell you, you will live without any poverty, without any, any complications, and you as a nation will prosper and grow. And that's important because we as God's people, we continually are looking for God's blessings. And God is continually, God hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you obey me, you will live at peace. You will live in prosperity. See, the key to prosperity isn't name it and claim it. The key to prosperity is, what did the Father tell me and do it? It's obedience. Obedience will bring the blessing and the prosperity of the Lord. We have to get that point. We have to grasp that. That is one of the keys to the maturity that God's trying to bring us into. It's all about obedience. We look so often, we want the prophetic. We want that prophetic word. We want the healing. We want the signs. We want the wonders. God says, I want the obedience. And we will get mad at God because he doesn't answer our prayer. And yet we turn around and we do the very things that he tells us not to do. And we expect him to bless that. And, and, and I, I've been getting a really strong sense from the Lord that the games are over. It's no longer a time to play church. We are, we, are, we are about to face something we've never faced before. And God is calling his church and his people, just like he did when he was bringing the, the nation of Israel into the land that he promised them. Sure, there were going to be signs and wonders. We know the Bible stories. They were going to be there. But there was something greater that God had on his heart. And is that, that is that the people of Israel would obey him and serve him as their God, as their Lord, as their king. Because obedience is a sign of love. You can't say you love God and you disobey his commands. You can't say you love God and you don't do what he's telling you to do. 
None of us can. Now, there's a growth in that. We, we, we've been all going through a growing process. But as I've watched most of us, me included, we begin growing in obedience to the Lord, and then we begin applying our common sense, and we grow out of our obedience to the Lord, because we know that. What the world's telling us makes more sense. And when I say the world, I don't just mean Hollywood and Bollywood and then and all of these media things. I mean the world that has infiltrated the church and it's become a carnal Christianity. Well, the church knows. The church tells us this. The pastors tell us that. They're carnal. If they do not have the mind of God, if they are not pointing people to Christ, to the mind of Christ, they are a carnal church. They are walking in the flesh. They are living by the flesh. And God is about to offer two things. Either this carnal church will wake up or they're going to find themselves fighting the Almighty. And they will be destroyed because carnal Christianity is an abomination under the Lord of all. Because carnal Christianity is an express is, is just one of the greatest expressions of the sinful heart of man. Yes, we worship Jesus and take him for our salvation, but we're going to do it our way. Jesus is not Lord. He's just a life insurance policy. And that is is never what God intended. Jesus was always to be Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We quote that verse over and over again. See, we, we have gotten to the point in Christianity where the Bible is commonplace. We've heard it taught so often, we don't even listen to what it's saying anymore. We sing it so often, we don't understand it. King of kings and Lord of lords. He is king. He is Lord. He is Lord. We sing that all the time, but we don't even know what it means. Yes, he is the king of all kings. He is the ultimate ruler over everything, including this king. This one who has set himself up as king over his own life. Jesus is the king over me. And I have to bow my knee to what he says. So, the Lord warns the people of Israel to be very, very careful about worshiping false gods that come from the lands and the people into which they're going. And we, we stopped with that last week. And the... the the Lord is saying, do not allow the people among whom you are living to influence what I told you. Don't let them interpret what I said. And, and interestingly, um, Chiyama actually had a, had a question before anybody got here, but it demonstrates, you mind if I share that? Okay. It demonstrates the reality of where we've come to in the church. Alabama, this past week, has signed one of the one of the toughest anti-abortion bills in the nation. Praise God. You know how many Christians are livid about that? They're angry. Because why? Abortion is a woman's right. They have allowed the world to influence their thinking. They have allowed the world to determine what is right and wrong. Folks, that's not being a Christian. And this is why I, I'm not being judgmental. I'm trying to look at the fruit. Are we really Christians? <laughs> okay, so we got another state. People have been praying, asking the Lord to take his lordship. And this is how we are going to win this fight. It is not about going into Congress unless God leads you to. It is not about petitions. It's not about uh, about. Uh, a protest or any of that thing, although if the Lord leads you, then let do what the Lord tells you. It is about getting before the King of Kings and saying, be the Lord of this nation, no matter what the cost. But are we willing to pay the cost? Because the cost could mean our jobs, our homes, our fancy furniture, our, technic, our technology, and everything else that we hold near and dear. Because when God starts to shake, Everything that is not of his kingdom will be shaken. 
How much do you really believe in the sanctity of life? Do you believe it enough to lay down your life for the Father who is life in order to see it happen? Do you believe it enough when it touches your family and causes your family to be the source of scorn and persecution and rocks being thrown and cars being smashed and everything else? Because that's what it's coming to. Abortion is only the first issue God's going to attack. But it's coming. And it is going to cause a great divide between the unsaved and the saved between the carnal Christians and the true church of Jesus Christ. And when that comes, are we going to be able to stand up under what is going to hit us? Are we going to be able to stand before the throne of God and say, God, I know you are who you said you are. I know you will do this. And I just simply ask you and, and just stand before the throne crying out for his heart. This is the age of the intercessors in the church, folks. That's why God has been raising them up. The, this whole house of prayer movement has got very little to do with Mike Bickle. It's got nothing to do with worship teams. It has everything to do with the fact that God is raising up in this day, in this age, a group of intercessors who will be before their face day and night, 24-7, crying out that the will of the one on the throne will come on the earth and be fulfilled and happen, that his kingdom will have its way on this earth. Because God is not going to let 8 billion people go into hell without rescuing the majority of them. That was never his heart. That's not. He loves the 8 billion as much as he loved the 170 million back in this day. God is raising up those in this age who are going to sit and stand with him and for him. Is that getting a little too cold? Because I can turn it up a little bit. <laughs> I apologize to those in the class. When I come in here and set up, I get really, really warm. It's too warm to open the window. So I turned it up. It should, it, that should shut off and it should warm up a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> But God is calling us to become his people once again. He's coming back for a bride that is pure and spotless and a bride that is functioning as a queen. <laughs> Nobody married a king until they were trained. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the princess that was chosen went through months and years of preparation being taught how to rule and reign, and not just to rule and reign. Let's get one thing straight. Even for the queen, there was nobody more important, deserving of more honor, and more deserving of everything she had than her king. The king was everything, and she was taught how to serve him, how to rule with him, how to encourage him, how to bring him pleasure, how to walk in intimacy with him, and how to love him with all her heart, soul, mind, and strength to the point that she would lay down her life for him. Who taught royalty how to do that? The one who was the ultimate king first and foremost. And God is raising up a bride who will walk in absolute Obedience, love, sacrifice, intimacy, that everything about her is going to be for her groom, for her king. There will be nothing that she looks for of herself. Because that is the bride that God is looking for. Because that is the bride that he is worthy of. And we, as the bride on the earth, have adopted a self-centered, selfish, egotistical attitude that says, I'm the one that's important. You got to take care of me, God. You got to meet my needs, God. You got to make sure that I'm getting what I want, God. God says, who do you think I am? Number one, I'm your husband. You don't tell me what to do. 
Number two, I'm your king. You really don't tell me what to do. Your life is mine. And we have, we have fallen in this age of finances, this economic age that makes every person an individual, every person totally free to do what they want to do. We have fallen for a lie that says, I'm the one who's most important. God says, no, you're not. I and I alone am the most important. And your life has to be laid down for me or your life is not worth the breath in. And folks, that sounds harsh, but he's God. And he created us for him. It was through him, through his love, through his heart, and for him and for his purposes that we were created. We were not created for ourselves. And we have to begin to grasp this. This is a, this is, so, I can't emphasize the weight that the Lord has put on me around this time, again, from what has happened since January onwards. God is ready to move us into something. And there is a heaviness on the heart of the Father that he is saying, it is time. I wasn't joking. It is time. It is time to take the steps of obedience. To, it's time to stop doing things the way that you always did them. It's time to start living in love. It's time for you to be the one to stand up. I was asking the Lord about something today. And one of the things that came to my mind was our, our many, many inner cities. We were just in Jersey City yesterday. I lived there for a couple years. We've been to Newark, and the Lord's always put this, this heavy burden on me for the cities and the inner cities. And I often wonder, why do they remain as they are? And they get worse. Everybody's scared of them. Why? Because they're dangerous. Well, it's just truth. You, you can get shot, beat up, and everything else. Why? Because the enemy has taken has taken the people of the inner city and has caused them to begin to live a life that they have to defend themselves. They have to live for themselves. They have to interpret things for themselves. And everything they do is a reaction of what they must do to take care of number one. And therefore, what happens? Number two gets shot. Number three gets beat up. Number four gets robbed. Because it's all about me, not everybody else. And it perpetuates this, this understanding of fear, of suspicion that is so ungodly. And all it takes is one person in that city to stand up and say, no, I will love as God loves. And that cycle can be broken. <clears throat> Folks, we can turn the inner city around. We can turn the cities around, but one person has to say, you know what? I don't get it. My street smarts tell me you come after me with a gun. I come after you with a gun a little bit quicker. My street smarts tell me you offend my family. I go beat the crap out of yours. My street smarts tell me you start giving me a hassle. Well, I'm going to work through my, my little crew, and I'm going to get them to, to give you a hassle. That's how we work in the streets. God smart says love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Turn the other cheek. And whether it's in the inner city or, or, or in the suburbs, everybody that I talk to about that kind of lifestyle tells me, no way, you're going to get yourself killed. You're going to get yourself walked all over. Folks, do we believe God or don't we? Is he really Lord? If he is, then let's make him Lord of our lives and therefore Lord of our city. And if God, if somebody comes and offends me, somebody comes and, and attacks my family, let's respond in love. Let's not try to go get them. Let's not get our peeps to get out there and set up this wonderful scheme to go, to go do them over. That's street smart. You know who rules the streets? Satan. We need to get God back on the streets. We need to make God the Lord of the streets. And it takes one person who says, God, I will. No matter what the cost, take my life, let my life run as the blood of the martyrs through the streets of the inner cities of America so that the blood of the martyrs can become the seedbed of the church once more. 
But to be honest, folks, we're all too cowardly to lay our lives down for our king. We don't want to give our blood, and yet our king gave his. And God is saying, the time has come. Will you be my people? Will you be who I called you to be? And as he, as he prepares to send the Israelites over, in, over the Jordan into the land he promised, he says, will you be my people? I am your God. God doesn't just say, I will be. I am your God. I am your Lord. I am your king. I am everything that you need. Will you be mine? I just want to read something. Because um, one of the things that is hard in the in the city is getting other people to come alongside you to stand for God. That's hard. Mm -hmm. But this is the reason why. And this is something that I ministered yesterday and it's still heavy on me. It says, but understand this, that in the last days will come and set perilous times and great stress and troubles, hard to deal with and hard to bear. For people will be lovers of themselves <laughs> and only self-centered lovers of money and aroused and innerly <laughs> greedy, desire for wealth, proud, proud and arrogant, contemporary, bolsterous. They will be abusers, blasphemers, scornful, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and profane. They will be without natural human affection, callous and inhuman, relentless, and many no trace of appeasement. They will be slanders, horse accusers, un troublemakers, intemperate and loose in morals and conduct, uncontrolled and fierce haters of good. They will be treacherous, betrayers, rash, and inflated with self conceit. They will be lovers of sensual pleasure and vain amusement more than rather than lovers of God. For all they had a form of pity, true religion, they deny and reject and are strangers to the power of it. They conduct leagues and generously of their profession, avoid all such people, turn away from them. And so many times we think this is addressing the world, but it's addressing the church. It's addressing the church, yeah. This is where the church is at. It because is. the church is, that's what you said that I said the church is selfie. Because we 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 all about ourselves now. Yeah. And when you are in the inner city and you see people gathering to these big churches to give them a bunch of fluff to keep them where they're at, you know, because they don't want to help the people. You try to get them to come alongside and say, listen, let's go into the streets. Let's talk to the people. Let's love on the people. Why are we afraid? Mm -hmm. Why are we afraid of 12-year-olds and 13-year-olds? Why? Because we don't believe God. Because we don't believe God. And you know why we don't believe God? Because we love ourselves more than we love God. Yeah. That's it. it, 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 it it's, it's something for, I, can't, I can't express the heaviness in the heart of Father right now over this. Because it, there's something about to come that he's been trying to get us ready for. Now, I, I want us to start in uh, Deuteronomy 13. Listen carefully to what the Lord tells the Israelites. I want you to think about where you've heard this before. Deuteronomy 13, verse 1. If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a miraculous sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder of which he has spoken takes place, and he says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God who you must follow, and him you must revere. Keep his commands and obey him. Serve him and hold fast to him. That prophet or dreamer must be put to death because he preached rebellion against the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. He has tried to turn you from the way of the Lord your God, the way the Lord your God has commanded you to follow. You must purge the evil from among you. If your very own brother or your son or daughter or the wife you love 
or your closest friend secretly entices you, saying, let us go and worship other gods, gods that neither you nor your fathers have known, gods of the people around you, whether near or far, from one end of the land to the other. Do not yield to him or listen to him. Show him no pity. Do not spare him or shield him. You must certainly put him to death. Your hand must be the first in putting him to death, and then the hands of all the people. Stone him to death because he tried to turn you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Then all Israel will hear and be afraid, and no one among you will do such an evil thing again. If you hear it said that about one of the towns the Lord your God is giving you to live in, that wicked men have arisen, uh, have arisen among you and have led the people of the town astray, saying, "Let us go and worship other gods, gods that have that we that you have not known." Then you must inquire, probe, and investigate it thoroughly. And if it is true, and it has been proven that this detestable thing has been done among you. You must certainly put to the sword all who live in that town. Destroy it completely, both its people and its livestock. Gather all the plunder of the town in the middle of the, of the public square and completely burn the town all and all its plunder as a whole burnt offering to the Lord your God. It is to remain a ruin forever, never to be rebuilt. None of those condemned things shall be found in your hands so that the Lord may turn his fierce anger. He will show you mercy, have compassion on you, and increase your numbers as he promised on oath to your forefathers because you obey the Lord your God, keeping all his commands that I have given you today and doing what is right in his eyes. So Moses says, when you get over into this land, if a prophet comes along, and he gives a prophetic word, he gives signs and wonders, and it comes true, right? Because proof of a prophet of the Lord is that the word he spoke comes true. And the word is followed by signs and wonders. Moses said, if you see all of this, and that prophet tells you to go follow other gods. Or let's put it this way. That prophet tells you to do things that the world would do instead of what God would do. Stone him. Kill him outright. Do not leave him alive. You know how many people would back out of prophecy and out of being prophets today if we would live up to that? There's such a misuse of the prophetic to draw people into ungodly actions, into ungodly behavior. Well, they prophesied, they read my book, and they just said that we're supposed to do this, this, and this. I don't care what they said. If it's not in here and it's not following this, it is not of God, no matter how accurate. And notice what, what Moses says. God is allowing. See, sometimes we give too much credence to the enemy. It's not Satan coming in to deceive you. God is allowing this prophet to get that word right and to, because he knows the heart of the prophet. He's allowing him to have signs and wonders because he is testing you. How much do you love me? When, 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 yeah. when, when, the, when, when everything looks good, are you going to follow the words of a man even when they go contrary to the words of my heart? Or will you stick to my heart and be the scorn of man? That's important. I know so many Christians that are following people that are just teaching every wind of doctrine, so to speak. Every, every idea of, and I'm not against psychology or psychiatry. God's given us an understanding of the human mind, of the human psyche, of the human soul that helps us to heal people and bring people into, into or out of some really strange effects of sin. That's a good thing. But that's not how we run the church. We run the church based on Jesus Christ and his lordship. And if he tells us to use those things, we use those things. 
But sometimes he tells us, I want to do this. Back off and let me. But if one comes along that seems to have all the credentials and tells you to do things in the way of the world, he says, That's, that person's not of me, and I'm testing your heart to see if you really love me. Do you love me enough to get rid of the evil in your presence? Then he says, let me take it and make it a little bit more personal. If your son, daughter, brother, sister, mother, father, wife, if any of them come to you and try to lead you away from my heart, away from following me, kill them. <laughs> it doesn't matter. The Lord said outright. See, understand one thing. We serve the true and living God. We serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And nothing, nothing but nothing is ever to be greater than Him. And God says, I don't care how close the person is. If they're trying to lead you into a way of unrighteousness, cut them off completely. Have nothing to do with that which is unclean. And if you hear a whole city, a whole state, a whole area of the country is going the way of the devil, cut them off, destroy them, get rid of them. This is the word of God. This is my understanding. Are we not going to win them? Well, let's take a look. Like I said, does this sound familiar to anybody? Turn to Luke. One of my favorite passages that everybody yells at me for. You can't be teaching that. Uh, Luke 16. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Although I like that. You one like too. that one too. Count the cost in chapter 13. No, 14. Chapter 14, Luke 14, verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own wife, he cannot be my disciple. Folks, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, well, Jesus came and he teaches love. No, Jesus said there's one love and one love alone, and that's the love of the Father and the love of me. And if anybody becomes greater than that, get rid of them. Allow nobody to come in the place between me and you. You should treat them as though they are an unclean thing if they're trying to take my position in your life. Folks, this is the one who gave his life to buy us. He hasn't changed. He was the same one there in the wilderness of Moab as the children of Israel getting ready to cross over. He said the same thing to them. Treat as unholy that which is unholy and let nothing come between me and you. I am to be first and foremost and only in your life. And anything that comes between that needs to be treated as though it is totally despised by you. Now, Jesus isn't telling us to kill them in the New Testament. He's saying our attitude towards them should be just that. We always we I don't I don't get this. We allow our family to influence us because our family gangs up on us. Well, if you're if you're going to do this Jesus stuff and you're going to talk like that, well, we're just going to make fun of you at family get-togethers and we're we're going to snub your kids and we're going to do all this. And we bow to that pressure. We, well, I just won't talk about Jesus when I'm in the family meeting. I won't talk about Jesus on my job because they, they don't like that. We don't want to offend them. Offend them. That's what Jesus says. Because they're offended. Do you understand who your God is? 
Do you understand what these people are saying about your God? That he is not worthy of everything in you. If they think they, that he's not worthy of everything in them, okay, you can plead that at the great right throne. I'm not. I fear the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if you don't want to follow me where he's taking me, good luck with that. That's right. We have to stop letting everybody and everything influence what we do. And that's what God is saying here. God is saying, when you enter into the place of your blessing, understand who it is that, that blessed you. Understand who gave you all of this and treat everything that you are and everything that you have as though it belongs to the king. <laughs> Paul said it this way. He said, the old is gone. The new has come. That old way of thinking, that way of street life that said, I'm the most important, I have to stay alive, I have to keep myself going, that's gone, it doesn't exist. And those who, those who try to get us to walk in that way, and Peter and, and Paul both said, that the people of the world, even your own family, are going to hate you. They're going to hate the fact that you don't do the things you used to do. And they're going to try to pull you out and pull you away. And they're going to do it with all kinds of pressures and seductions and everything else. And Jesus is just sitting on the throne saying, who is more important, them or me? Well, that's not fair. We're not talking about fair. We're talking about kingdom. Quite honestly, what have they given you that's greater than what God has given you? Folks, we've got to start thinking of things in the right way. Matthew, um, sorry, Matthew 12, 48 says basically the same thing. Yeah, it's, a, it's a parallel passage. Yeah, right to that. And it's it, about the same thing. And, you know, um, we had something was said yesterday in church because a wife is going through uh, cancer and the husband said like he can't take it and he wanted to commit suicide and I was like you're just being selfish you're being selfish right now you not have to have a compassion on what she's going through you know and the mother was all upset and the scripture was was who is my mother and who is my father but they that do the will of my father yes I have natural sister and I love her but my sisters in Christ, who have been to their knees to the Lord, are my sisters. And we missed that point. And I'm not saying that she's not my natural sister. Yes, I love her. But she still has to bend her knees. Yeah. <clears throat> no Jesus, matter what. Jesus said that those who follow him and obey him and give up houses and land and family, Jesus said they will receive a thousandfold in the kingdom to come and hundreds and hundreds in this life. God will bring about the reward of everything that you've given up if you believe him. Problem is we don't believe him. We don't believe God. God is not God in our mind. God, for most of us as believers, we're still at the place. Excuse me. Well, I might even ask for forgiveness. <laughs> this is going to sound harsh. Most of us as Christians are no better than Hindus. It's just that instead of Krishna and Shiva and Lakshmi up on the shelf, we put a picture of Jesus. And we do our daily obeyances, our daily prayers, and our daily sacrifices, and all that stuff. We give our offerings and so on to the temple, and then we live our lives any old way we want. And the only time we really get scared is when something bad happens to us. Then we think, we, we, we don't think, God, I haven't bowed my knee. We think, God, you're mad at me and you're punishing me. You see, it's still about me. It's not about God. And God is saying, when you get into the land that I'm bringing, you understand this is about me. This is my land. And I'm setting you up as those who will be my stewards of my kingdom, of my blessing, of my land. But understand mine. And you are to come to me. You're to bring everything to me. You are to obey me. God, it, God never budges on that point from Genesis to Revelation. It's always about obedience. Now, how do we know what to obey? Intimacy. You don't know 
You can say, you can go to every preacher, you can go to every Christian counselor, you can go to every Christian in the church and say, what should I do about this? There's only one person that can answer that question, and that's God. Stop going to everybody else and start going to the throne. God, this person offended my family. How quickly do you get on Facebook and say, what do you do about somebody like this? How quickly do you pick up the phone and talk to everybody else and say, what do you think I should do about this? And how much time did you spend on your face at the throne of the Father and say, God, what do I do about this? You know why we don't? Because we know just like everybody else, just like Joan, the Father's going to say, you love them. You love them. You love them like I love them. And here's how you express my love. But we want revenge. We want vengeance. We want justice on our behalf. And God will bring justice in his time. God will bring vengeance in his time. But his heart, his desire for right now is more important than my justice. And we won't go to God because we're afraid that he's going to bless that person and we're never going to see them hurt because they hurt us and they deserve to get hurt. Folks, this is where the kingdom of God becomes real. God made it very plain to the people of Israel. The rubber's going to meet the road here. Guess what? Solomon did not obey God. And he had, what was it? 12,000, 1,200 wives and 1,500 concubines. And what happened? They led him astray to worship the gods of the nations around him. The most wise and knowledgeable man that ever lived got drugged down by famine because he would not, instead of going into the temple, that he built. Folks, don't think you're above this because you're in ministry. Solomon built the temple. He was there and dedicated it with a prayer that said, God, when we repent, bless us and cause us. And what did he do within 10, 20, 30 years? He was bowing before false gods. And I will question one thing. How often was he in that temple? <laughs> Because the only way that we stand true to our God is when we're sitting in intimacy with him. When we know him deeper than anything. When we, we are so in tune with his heart that, you know what, I, when somebody tells me to do something contrary to it, I weep. It hurts that somebody would actually even suggest that I react differently than what my father would react to. And then I don't want to pick up the phone and ask everybody. My first reaction when somebody does something to me or my family is, God, what do I do? What do I do, Father? How do I handle this? <laughs> I know you're going to tell me to love them. I don't have it in me. Can you teach me how to love? Did you ever stop to think that many times the greatest offenses in our lives were allowed by God because he wanted to teach us to love as he loves? Be careful what you ask the Father. He is Jehovah sneaky, and I mean that with all reverence. He gets us in his presence, and God, I want to, you love me so much. God, I want to love like you do. God, teach me to love. And he says, I've been waiting for you to ask me that. And all hell breaks open in our lives. Why? Because how is the love of the Father shown the in the greatest way with the greatest rebellion when somebody spit in God's face God got angry and then he turned around and poured everything of his being into saving that person that spit in him I don't know if you've ever been spit on but I'll tell you from experience it's humiliating think about what we've done to the Father. And yet he continues to love. And yet we can't respond in love to somebody 
who mistreats us. Folks, this is where the rubber meets the road. I don't care who it is. God says, this is real. This is a real kingdom. These are real laws. This is real life. And it can be lived because God is never going to tell us to do something that he can't do through us. It's just how willing are we to surrender. To be honest, I want to end, but <laughs> uh, there, there's just such there's such a heaviness. I've been feeling it for weeks now. There's a heaviness in the heart of Father. We need to get this. It's time. We need to stop talking about it. We need to stop discussing it. We need to stop making suggestions to one another. And we need to start doing it. Because God is about to give us the absolute best situations to live it out. We've got to put aside ourselves. It's not about me. Yes, I'm going to get hurt. But is, is he Jehovah Rapha or no? We talk about God heals, and then we want to take vengeance because they hurt us. Give your hurt to God and let him heal it. And then turn around. Well, I'm not going to let them do that again. Why not? How long suffering was the Father with you? How many times did you... God forgave you, and God blessed you, and God moved you on, and you turned around and still did it your own way. And God forgave you, and he blessed you, and you turned around and still did it your own way. And yet one person does that to once, us to once. We want to cut them off, stone them, and get rid of them. Curse them, Lord. <laughs> it's time to live like we really have Jesus inside of us. And the way we do that is saying is it's getting with him no matter what it is. My anger will give a quick response to something. Wisdom tells me to get before the Father and ask him what really needs to be done. And it's time to do that. That's why God doesn't condemn anger. God gets angry. Anger is simply an emotion. But God says, be slow to anger. When God is angry, it's because it's been building up for a very, very, very long time. Most of us, we'll let some things brew. But when it's a personal offense against us, our anger flares up so quick and we're attacking and ripping and tearing and snarling and snapping and snopping and because it's about me. God says, be slow. Don't, don't not be angry. Scripture never says that. It says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, something got you angry, deal with it quickly. And how do you deal with anger? Go to the throne and say, God, what do I do? They hurt me. I feel the hurt. It's really bad. You're Jehovah Rapha. Bring healing. Bring healing to my soul. Bring healing to my emotions. Bring healing to my to, to my ego. Ask the Lord to do that. There's nothing wrong with praying that. God gave you your ego, okay? You just inflated it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason for, for, for that part of you that has an identity of, of who you are. It's what God made you to be. The problem is we exalt that thing a little bit too much. And we exalt our ego, but then everybody else's ego has got to get put down and deflated because they're, they're too egotistical. They're too focused on their ego. What does, what does, what does scripture say? Consider others more important than yourself. Deflate your own ego and inflate others. You know, if we would all do that, think about it. If each and every one of us would spend every day building each other up, 
None of us would ever feel that. None of us would ever feel it's not enough or not sufficient. Because every day we're building. If you're married, you know. That's an important part of marriage. Building each other up. And when you don't, because we're human, we're growing, we go through things, we're struggling with things. We get hurt and our reaction to hurt isn't to go to the father. Our reaction is... And you go through a period of time where husband and wife are at each other's throat. What happens? Neither husband nor wife feels sufficient, accepted, loved, or anything else. And soon the marriage is on the rocks. And, and, and the ego still plays. Because what do we do? See, they're not, they're not giving me my, they're not meeting my needs. They're not, they're not doing this for me. They need to do it. If one of us would just lay down our lives and start building the other up, regardless of the reaction, this is, let me, scripture is practical. Die to yourself and begin to live in obedience to what the Lord says. Build up the other person. Guess what? Eventually, their scarred, bruised ego is going to get healed. And they're going to begin to build you up. God made us that way for a reason. Because we weren't meant to live independently. We're meant to need each other. We're meant to need him. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Chapter 14. You are the children of the Lord your God. You, you hear how often the Lord says that? The Lord your God. You are the children of the Lord your God. This is what he's saying to Israel. And they haven't even been born again yet. When Jesus came, he gave us what? The right to be called the sons of God. We are the children of God. Do not cut yourselves or shave the front of your heads for the dead. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possession. What's that mean? Well, the nations of that area, when somebody would die, for the sake of the person that, that died, they would cut themselves. They would shave their head. God said, don't be like them. Don't be like them. Don't. Don't. Look at death as, as something that is so horrible that you have to mutilate yourself in mourning for somebody who died. Understand who your God is. You are the children of the living God. You have God who is with you and for you. You are a people that is holy unto him. You're different. Live differently. Folks, sometimes I, I, I claim my... my Seeming lack of emotion on being German. And it's not true. I just, everybody knows Germans are really stiff and, and ascetic. <laughs> but a lot of times it's not that. I don't get emotional at the death of a brother or sister in Christ. Even if it's my close relative. Why? I'm going to see him again. What an absolute shame to the name of Jesus when a believer is weeping and wailing and throwing a, a hissy fit because somebody who knows the Lord has passed on. Well, still, well, Bob, some of that's cultural. You're not of that culture. You're of the kingdom of God. How is anybody going to know that Jesus has conquered death and I don't fear it if I'm rolling on the floor in hysterics because somebody I love died? Folks, let's face some reality here. Yeah, I'm going to miss him for a few years, but I'm going to meet up with him again. What a great witness. I don't fear death. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? You have no power over me, and you have no power over that person. You have no power over the relationship. Sure, God's going to let you take me one day. And guess what? I'm just going to go, hello, it's been a long time. It's been a few years since we saw each other. And I know you already know what's been happening to me. Catch me up. 
Folks, we have to stop looking at things the way the world does. God says, be holy, be different. Live like you know me. Live like you believe that I am alive and I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do. Don't live like the nations in total, absolute despair. Even in the face of death, don't live that way. Verse 3, do not eat any detestable thing. And then he goes down through verse... Through verse 19, talking about all the clean and unclean. I'm going to skip all that because we went through that in Leviticus and, and, and Exodus. Go back and read it if you need a reminder of it. He's just, again, recounting all of that and summarizing all of that. of What is clean food? What is unclean food? The basic law is splits the hoof and choose the cud. It has to be both for, for, for mammals. For other animals, there's just a list of them. Verse 21, do not eat anything that you find already dead. You may give it to an alien living in any of your towns, and he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner, but you are a people holy to the Lord your God. In other words, he said, don't eat roadkill, folks. If the foreigner wants to do that, God didn't say they can. You notice the difference here. You say, God, that's a double standard. God says, yep, sure is. God is a God of a double standard. He has a standard for his people. And the rest of them, well, they're going to live the way they're going to live. So you know what? Walk, you come across the dead cow in your field, don't you eat that. Sell it to the farmer if they want to. It died naturally. So give it away. Let them have it. Let them eat it. But you don't. And notice the reason. And this is so important. Because you are a people holy to the Lord. <clears throat> Don't cook a young goat in its mother's milk. That sounds real random. <laughs> and in the law, you see that all the time. But think about, think about, think about what God is saying there. It's the mother's milk that gives life and sustains that little goat. Don't take that which gives life and use it to produce death. God's real, God is a God who is life. And God wants to separate those two things. Sure, the goat's dead. You killed it. You sacrificed it. You're going to cook it. And if you're smart, you're going to use all kinds of nice curries and spices and stuff like that and make it really good. Or, you know, barbecue it up nice. It's delicious. I don't know how many of you eat it. God says eat it, but don't mix death and life. And that's a principle of God's kingdom that we have violated in America. We have become a culture of death. We live honoring death. Why do you think we got skulls everywhere? It wasn't always like that. Mm -mm. When I grew up, you didn't see skulls and skulls and crossbones and all of that. When you did, you knew it was somebody that was into Satanism, witchcraft, some kind of something really bad. Yeah, the, the heavy metal bands that were all into the Satanism and so on. There was something wrong with that. You didn't live under death. And yet, we do that all the time. Why do you think... Abortion took over this nation because we accepted death and life and mixed them together. Well, people go in the cemeteries. Who what? Go in the cemeteries. Yeah. yeah, I see it all the time. I see cemeteries filled with people, not burying people, but going back, talking to them and putting flowers yeah. and all this stuff on making memorials. And, I don't get it. But again, that, that's the concept of understand what death is. Understand who your God is. Okay. And folks, I can tell you, I, I'm not talking coldly here. Okay. Unfortunately, God has taken me through many experiences. My father died without knowing the Lord. He committed suicide. I will never see him again. But I'm not going to live in that. Because my God's a God of life. My God is a God who has overcome death. And just because my father couldn't accept that doesn't mean I'm going to live like him. 
I'm going to live in the joy of the Lord, and I'm not going to let I'm not going to let that spirit magnitude of death take over in my life, and I'm not going to let it rule me. Guess what? Was it a sad event? It was a very sad event. It's in the past. It's gone. It's over. I'm moving on into the things of the Lord. That sounds cold. And again, I, a lot of times people think that I'm very unemotional and very cold. Fact of the matter is, I can't do anything about it. They sure. died either at the hands of man or at the hands of God. Doesn't matter what it was, how it was, or whatever it was. It's in the past. It's gone. And if you're living back there, you can't move into what God has you. This is why, this is why Hebrews chapter 12 says, put off. The sin that so easily entangles. The understanding of the way things work that come out of your own thoughts, your own understanding, or the ways of the world that do what? Come like a, like a clamp around your foot so that you cannot move forward. Let it behind. That the lead Paul says that of everything that's happened to me, all of my past, I leave that behind and I press forward to attain and achieve the high calling to which God has called me to. Paul wasn't just talking about, oh, my sinful life and the way that I used to do things. No, he's talking about my relationships and my understanding. The things of my past are past, they're gone, and I'm moving forward. I'm not allowing anything to hold me back from that which God has called me to. And yet we want to continuously live in the past. Let me ask you a question. When your family gets together, how much do you talk about where the Lord's calling you and how much do you discuss everything that happened to your family in the past? How many of us are stuck in the past? Oh, well, I've gotten over that. Really? If I come into your family's gathering, am I going to hear all of that? And that's going to be the focus of it all? Well, you remember when this person did this? You remember when this person did that? You remember? You, it's gone. Leave it in the past. Move on. Can, you cannot. Scripture says, eye has not seen and ear has not heard. And you cannot imagine with your imagination the things that God has in store for those who love him. But we want to sit and stare at a garbage heap that is so long gone. We don't look forward to what God is in front of us. Yes, I've been offended. Yes, I've been hurt. Yes, I've lost things. Yes, I haven't had dreams fulfilled. Yes, I have, I've been in a place of great disappointment. Yes, people have hurt me. God has something greater. Why am I playing around with those knives and razors? Let them go. They're garbage. They're filth. They're worthless. Why do we keep going back to them like a dog to vomit? And wonder why we're anorexic and thin and... and, and, and Folks, okay, I don't know why the Lord just hit me with that. Yeah. Our focus on looking disgustingly thin in this day and age is a reflection on just what the Lord said. We're like dogs returning to the vomit. We're not nurturing ourselves and growing into what God. There was a day and age, and many of you who are my age or, or, or older, you remember what happened to people. They got married, and what did we say? They grew old and fat and happy together. <laughs> and they didn't care. Why? Because they got married, and everything that was behind them, everything happened was behind them. They had one thing in front of them, and that is we are going to love each other until the day we die. We're going to enjoy every minute that we have together. We're going to enjoy the life that God gave us. And they didn't care how they looked. But we are so obsessed with famine. Now God <laughs> made some of us skinny. Okay, and that's something God did. God made all of us very unique. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about an attitude of our minds that looks at people and the way they are, their shape and their size, and condemns them rather than glorifies the God who created them. That is an attitude of death. That is an attitude that looks in the past 
and never allows anybody to progress to the future. Because you know what? I don't know what that person's going to look like or what God has for them. But I don't care what they look like. I only care what God has for them. We focus so much on the flesh, so much on the natural. And I'm not talking let's all get unhealthy and, and all of that. Okay? Although if you want to throw me all your leftover bacon because you don't want to eat it, throw it here. I don't know. <laughs> I'll eat that on top of all the burgers in the bed I have in the north. <laughs> but I, what I'm saying is, let us come to the place where our focus and our heart and our mind is so set on God that what you or I or anybody else around us looks like doesn't matter. I, 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 get, I get sick in my spirit when I hear people comparing how they look to other people. Oh, well, this person's going to come. They're going to be dressed up, and I'm going to look like such a bum. Oh, this person, look at them. They're just exercising. They look really good. They look so thin, and, and I just look so fat and so frumpy. Folks, love who God made you. You will never be able to change that until you accept it. When you accept who you are and you go before the Father in grateful thanksgiving for who and what and how he made you, only then will you be in a place of peace where he can tell you how to make it better. Because only he knows. There ain't a doctor, a medicine, a dietitian, a physical therapist, or any gym person who can tell you how to make your body better. Only the one that made the body can tell you that. And we need to get out of that way of thinking that focuses every on us, on this world, on the natural, because that's what it is. Like I said, I, I'm all for being healthy, but I'm all for being healthy as the Lord tells me to be healthy. I've noticed when people start focusing on health, on weight, on exercise, on the body, on how they look, on what they're wearing and everything else, their spiritual life goes down. And I've seen it over and over and over again. Because what happens when you focus on the body? Your eyes focus on the natural. When you focus on the spirit, your eyes focus on God. You begin to hear him. You begin to walk with him. You hear what he's telling you. And then, well, this isn't helping me lose weight. Well, did you do what he told you to do? See, that's the key. We hear God telling us things like, I'm not doing that. That doesn't make sense. If I just go keto, I'll lose all of this weight. Look at everybody else. They go on keto. Did God tell you to go keto? If God didn't tell you to go keto, guess what? Keto is going to kill you. Because keto wasn't made for your body. Okay? I, I know this sounds like I'm harping on something. I get yelled at this for this all the time. But the point is, God is saying, listen to me. Come to me with your problems. And when I tell you to do something, do it. Obedience to the Lord will bring prosperity and health. And we've seen this over and over again as the Lord was preparing his people to walk into the land. He says, if you will obey me, if you will follow what I'm telling you, you will live in prosperity in your land. You will live in health. There will not be one person that is poor that lives among you. If, 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 if. And my biggest issue that I get from people is, well, I, I tried that and it didn't work. Really? How often did you try it? Well, God told me to do this and it didn't work out right. Well, did you do everything he told you to do? Obedience in one point is obedience in one point. What about the 7,827 other points he's been trying to get you to obey on? Folks, we want to manipulate God. If God doesn't do what we what we think he's supposed to do on this one point, when he's worthless and I'm not going to follow what he tells me anymore. And if he doesn't do it in the timing, <laughs> it's been 10 years and I haven't, God hasn't given me my house. <laughs> Well, so it might be another 10 years. Are you God's not concerned with your house, he's concerned with your faith. Are you willing to trust him? Okay. 
Now, remember last week, the Lord taught a little something of it. Progressive revelation comes in chronological revelation from God. From the very beginning, God says, give me the first and the best of all your increase. Then he, and that's what we call the tithe. Then he lays down for his people and says, that is one-tenth of all of it. And then we saw last week, <laughs> he, he, says, he says to the people at, at Horeb, bring your tithe to the, to the temple. And offer it to the Lord there. Last week we saw the Lord says, now when you get in the land and you have the your tithes, you need to bring that to the place that I'm setting up as my dwelling and bring your whole family, the Levites, and all of your manservants and maidservants and everyone around you and eat it in my presence. Like I said, I don't know about you. I, how many of you have ever heard that on the tithe message? Okay. Eat the tithe. Bring it to me and enjoy it, but enjoy it in my presence. Recognize, acknowledge that this is me who gave this to you. Now, let's see. He, he has another thing here. Verse 22, be sure to set aside a tenth of all your field, all that your fields produce each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine and oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks, and in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name, so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. But if that place is too distant, and you have been blessed by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe because the place where the Lord will choose to put his name is so far away, then exchange your tithe of silver. Take the silver with you and go to the place the Lord your God will choose. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, and other fermented drink, and anything you wish. Then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice, and do not neglect the Levites living in your town, for they have no allotted allotment or inheritance of their own. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your town so that the Levites, who have no allotments or inheritance of their own, and the aliens, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns, <laughs> may come and eat and be satisfied so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the works of your hands. And so he says for, for two years, notice this is a cycle of three. A cycle three represents God. It's the number of God. It's a completeness. It's a, it's a wholeness. He says for two years... Bring your tithe to the place of my dwelling and eat it there with your family and those associated with you. Remember the Levites, bring them along. In other words, take care of those that are in full-time service. Make them a part of what you're celebrating and enjoying. And God says, if, if, if God, if I blessed you so much that to bring all of that one-tenth is too much because you live too far away, Sell the tent, turn it into silver, and then you and your family and all with you come down to the place of my dwelling. Use that silver to buy whatever you want. Cattle, wine, oil, whatever. Prepare a meal in my presence and eat it there for two years. Third year, take all the first tenth of your produce and put it in a storehouse in your town. And if you do that, that'll take care of the Levites, the fatherless, the poor, the widows. It'll take care of all of that. You see, there's no, no need, there's no lack in the kingdom of God if we obey him. But as I said before, most Christians will not even give the tent. God says, give, give the tenth, but in Acknowledge me as the one who has given you the first of your increase and enjoy the first of your increase with me. 
That's why it's in his presence. Because when I'm enjoying it in his presence, I'm including God in it. And he said, every three years, I want you to take everything that I've given you, the first tenth of it, and put it in a storehouse and leave it there so that the Levites and the poor, you have enough to distribute to keep everybody who is in need taken care of and satisfied. That's only once in three years. And yet we as Christians and churches, we're pounding people to give every single week. God says no to run. To, to, and it's not, yes, it's to take care of the Levites, but that's only part of it. It's also to take care of the poor, the widow, the fatherless, all of those that are in need. God says you only need one year. One year of tithe will take care of three years of need. Notice it's three, because you have the year that it's brought in, you have the two years that it's eaten, and you got another year before that third year tithe is brought in. It's like the, the Sabbath. The sixth year, what did you do? You brought in, God said, I will give you seventh year, you're gonna let your lands stay fallow. You're not gonna, you're not gonna um, you're not going to farm it. But I will give you enough in the sixth year to cover the seventh year and to cover the following year after that because you didn't plant in the seventh year. So your eighth year, you don't have anything till the harvest comes in. God says, I will give you all of that in the sixth year if you obey me. If you keep my Sabbath and if you keep my Sabbath year. And if you keep my year of Jubilee, the 48th year, I will provide enough that will last you the rest of the 48th year, all of the 49th year, and through most of the 50th year until the Sabbath, till the harvest comes in again. That's three years. See, do you believe God is who he says he is? If you do, you will have no problem giving him that pen and enjoying it the way he says. Acknowledge him in it. It doesn't mean you have to sit and eat up all your tithe right away. If God tells you to God tells you to go out and enjoy it, use it for you, for acknowledging him in it. Use it for the things that he tells you to. But understand that you also need to put aside to take care of the poor, the widow. That's our responsibility. God hasn't changed. And God says, if you do this, I'll make it last. I'll make it happen. Chapter 15. At the end of every seven years, you must cancel debt. Ooh. Boy, how would our society run today? <laughs> you notice the spirit of economy, the spirit of economics that rules our age goes directly against God's way of economy. At the end of every seven years, you must cancel every debt. This is how it is done. Every creditor shall cancel the loan he has made to his fellow Israelite. He shall not require payment from his fellow Israelite or brother because the Lord, the Lord's time for, of, for canceling debts has been proclaimed. You may require payment from the foreigner, but you must cancel any debt your brother owes you. However, there should be no poor among you, for it is the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance. He will richly bless you if only you fully obey the Lord and be careful to follow all these commands I am giving you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised, and you will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule you. If there is a poor man among you, your brothers, in any of the towns the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your poor brother. Rather, be open-handed open and freely lend him whatever he needs. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year of canceling debts is near, so that you do not show ill will towards your needy brother and give him nothing. He may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to him and do it so do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, 
I command you to be open-hearted, open-handed towards your brothers and toward the poor and needy on your land. God says, I, I'm making you as a nation. You as my people. There will be no poor among you. Now, that sounds contradictory because he said there's always going to be poor in the land. Well, God said there is to be no poor in the land because everyone is to be taken care of. And God's principle of giving is expressed right here. See, we always say, oh, God said in the Old Testament, give a tenth. In the New Testament, he says he loves a cheerful giver. God says in the Old Testament, give cheerfully. When somebody has a need, give to them open-handedly, not tight-fistedly. And give to them without complaining, without grumbling, without mention. Give with a cheerful heart. What, what, what does he say here? Um, give, generously. give generously to him and do so without a grudging heart. How often does the Lord give us an opportunity to give and then we sit and complain that we gave to this person and they used it this way and they did this with it. And, and you know what? They're doing this and that. And why should I give to him? I mean, I can't even do that. And that's just, don't give. Because you've just canceled your blessing from the Lord. To give with a grudging heart is to cancel the blessing that God intended to come from giving. And again, I'm asking some tough questions because the Lord's really serious about this. How many of us who give and give and give and give don't ever receive the blessing? Ask yourself, how often have you complained about the people you've given to? Because that's a grudging heart and you've canceled the blessing God intended for you. Give and never think about it. And God, God says, don't be, don't be shrewd about this. And God says it's a wicked thought. You know what? They're asking me for five hundred dollars, and, and next week starts year of jubilee. Starts the seventh year. Starts the year of canceling debt. They ain't gonna give me back that five hundred dollars in a week. I don't think I have it today. Go, go go talk to Sarah. She's better at this giving stuff than I am. God says that's a wicked thought. You're thinking more of yourself than the need of that person that I sent to you. God said, just because tomorrow starts the day of canceling debt, give them the five hundred dollars and understand that God will bless you when you cancel their debt tomorrow. Because your income doesn't come from any person, and the money that God gives you doesn't belong to you. And if he can give you that money today and you lose that money tomorrow because God said to cancel the debt, God will provide the money that was lost. Because God said, I don't intend for anybody to be poor. And we always love that. We always love to think that way when it's somebody else. But God says, think about your own situation. You think pretty highly of yourself that you don't have this need today. But you may have that need tomorrow. This Sabbath, this, this this period of Sabbath years, you didn't have that. Next period of Sabbath years, you may be sitting on the last day of that Sabbath period, ready for the cancellation of debt and in need of an even greater amount of money. And somebody's going to do the same for you that you that I'm asking you to do for them. You see God's heart for giving. God's heart for, for the use of money. Give it generously. And why do we do that? How can we do that? We can't just do that out of our own understanding. You can only give generously without grudging when you're trusting in the Lord, your God. Because I understand that no matter what I give out, God can give it back and will because he promised. See, again, it's a matter of you say you believe, but when the rubber meets the road, how genuine is your thing? How real is it? Well, I believe God can provide for all of my needs. Okay? When your brother has greater needs than you and God says, give to them and understand, you're never going to see that money again. And also understand that when you give it to them, they're going to go out and use it on things that you didn't you don't approve of or don't think they should. 
But I want you to give it anyway. Oh, Sally. <laughs> Will we do it? Without complaining? Without saying, oh my gosh, let's see, we gave them that money and they went and did this, this, and that. They took a trip to Aruba. I haven't even been able to go for a trip down to Newark. You know. <laughs> but how often do we do that? How often do we do that? God says, acknowledge me and what I'm telling you to do and trust me. <laughs> Verse 12, if a fellow Hebrew, a man or woman, sells himself to you and serves you six years, in the seventh year you must let him go free. And when you release him, do not send him away empty-handed. Supply him liberally from your flock. Give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. But if your servant says to you, I do not want to leave you because he loves you and your family and is well off with you, then take an awl and push it through his earlobe into the door and he will become your servant for life. Do the same for your maidservant. Do not consider it a hardship to set your servant free because his service to you these six years has been worth twice as much as that of a hired hand. And the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. In other words, the Lord, somebody, somebody gets indebted to you and, and they have to pay the debt off and they do it by service of you. And because they got a heart for the Lord, they do it better than somebody that you would pay. God says after seven years, they need to be released of that. But notice the heart of God. Not only do you release them from your service, but you make sure that they are set up with everything they need to get back on their feet. Well, that doesn't sound fair. They owed me the money. They did the work for the money. Now you're telling me to give the money back to them. That's God. You get what you don't deserve. It's called grace. You get treated in a way that you don't deserve to be treated. That's called mercy. We want it for ourselves. God says you got to live. You got to live that what you have and what you own is not more important than the other people that God puts around you. And I know this is hard teaching for most people because. It's putting yourself in a place of hardship and a possibility of loss and a place of being, quote, unquote, taken advantage of. <laughs> in a place of vulnerability. But that's what the kingdom of God is about. Because the, the question it comes down to is how much do you trust your God to take care of? Okay. The Lord's talked a lot this year about obedience. And it's only obedience that brings growth. He started out at the beginning of the year telling, talking to us about maturing and growing up and becoming who he told us to be. And, and we've seen it as as we've looked at his interactions with the Israelites, that he wants his people to see things from his perspective, to do things from his heart, according to his will, according to his desire. And the only way that we can do that is as we know him. As we keep our eyes off of the world, we keep our eyes off of the way everybody else does things. <laughs> and again, back to Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 
verse 1, the writer of Hebrews says, because we have those who have done this. And they're not perfect. Because he mentions Abraham. He mentions Sarah. He mentions Moses. All of these people, they made mistakes. Some of them costly mistakes. But he says they held on to their faith. And because we have it written in history of these men and women who have done this, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us throw off everything that hinders. Everything. Anything that keeps us from becoming what God has called us to be. Let us lay it aside. Put it aside. If it's not of God, it's not worth holding on to. And let us throw, um, and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out before us. Not let's try to struggle through this. The writer of Hebrews, the Holy Spirit says, let us run. And run at a steady pace with perseverance, not giving up. Our, our spiritual lungs burn. I don't know how many of you have done any kind of distance running. I can tell you after about a quarter of a mile, my body is drenched in sweat. My calves are hurting. My lungs are heaving. My throat is dry. I remember my friend and I were trying to get that two-mile stretch. And we just kept pushing and pushing. And after a while, you pushed and you were coming around that circle to the zero mark again. You made that two miles. But it, you, did, you couldn't stop. You don't stop because things hurt. You don't stop because you feel like you're going to fall over. You don't stop because you feel weak. Holy Spirit says, Run the race that is before you. Run, run, go at a, at a speed towards that which I have made you to be and persevere at it. Don't give up. This is not the time for giving up. He says, let us, how do we do it? Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. How do we make this happen? I have so many people come to me and say, how, how, do, we, how do we make this happen? This sounds great. I want to see the church become this. How do we do it? By getting our minds and our hearts and our eyes off of everybody else and fixing them on Jesus. <coughs> What's that? That's says Psalm 27, verse 4. This one thing I desire uh, yeah. that I will seek after that to, to dwell in the temple of the Lord, to gaze upon his <coughs> And you see, in many ways, I'm glad Mike Bickle canceled one thing. Because one thing became such a common phrase, we mm. forgot where it came mm, from. That's right. Mm. Yeah. The One Thing Conference originally was set up to draw young people to a place of coming to that point of Psalm 27 for yeah. one thing have I desired and this have I, have I yearned for, that I may sit in his presence and gaze on his beauty. Do you know how many people tell me that that's the biggest, most foolish thing you can do? What a waste. Just gazing at Jesus, just sitting and, and looking at Jesus, just, just sitting and praying and, and, and sitting with scripture and, and, and just hearing and, and, and listening to what Jesus and learning who Jesus is. What a waste of your life. Go get a degree, get a job, become a doctor, become a scientist, get rich, write a book. But those people have many things that you can have. Exactly. That's why they don't know what they're talking about. Because mm -hmm. once you gave them people, we know that they're going to be at people. And see, Jehovah Sneaking has brought all of you to this class for these last four years. 
and he has revealed himself to me. And he's saying now, I want you to lay everything else aside and look only unto me. Look at me. The Father isn't just saying, know me anymore. That's right. The Father is sitting on the throne saying, my children, look at me. Get your eyes off of the plane of this world. Get your eyes off of yourself. Get your eyes off of off of you and off of everything around you and off of what everybody else has for you and look at me. I, I know people, I get yelled at all the time, but you know what? The world understands what I'm saying better than the church does. The church excuses themselves. J.P. Morgan Chase, one of the biggest, most firm financial companies in the world, thousands of employees worldwide, has challenged every one of their employees this month to unplug. Get off Facebook, get off your technology, get off everything that's out there and unplug and get yourself detoxed, and that's what they're calling it. Unplug and detox yourself from technology. And they're challenging people to do this. Why? Because technology has allowed us to look at everybody in the world. Before, we could only see Mr. and Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Mr. Johnson next door and the people that we would meet in church. That's all we could see. That's why we would be keeping up with the Joneses, because the Joneses live next door, and we could see what they were bringing in, and we'd have to go get the same thing. And after a while, the Joneses got smart and realized, we can afford this. We can make their life miserable. They get better and better and better stuff, and you're out there going broke trying to keep up with them. But now, we can keep up with the Joneses and the Patels and the Shahs and the, <laughs> and the Yings and the Yangs and all of the people all over the world who are doing everything more and better than us. And guess what? We're living in a toxic situation. And God is saying, do me a favor. Get your mind unplugged from the world and just spend a month gazing at me. Just look at me. Just let, let your eyes see everything about me. Because only when you see me will you know me. Jesus, who looked at the joy that was set before him. What was the joy that was set before Jesus? The father saying, well done, son. As a man, Jesus had no assurance that this plan of Jehovah was actually going to work. Because even as God, it ain't ever been done before. Jesus as a man had nothing to say. We have this to look back on and say it can be done. It's been done. God is faithful. What did Jesus have to look at? Whoever took all the sins of all mankind, past, present, and future on themselves, submitted themselves to death and rose again from the dead. Who? Anywhere. The man Jesus could only do one thing. Look at the Father. Look at the face of the Father and just know he won't fail me. He's going to see me through this. And for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He endured the scorn. He endured the shame. He endured the humiliation. He was beaten after he was, okay, folks, think about it. He was beaten and whipped. After he was beaten and whipped, they spit on him. It's one thing, it's unsanitary to get somebody else's spit in your skin. Now think about it going into an open wound. And not just one person, the whole Praetorian Guard there. Think of the humiliation of that. And yet he endured it. How did he endure it? <laughs> the joy that was set before him. The face of the Father. He spent hours and hours every day in prayer before the Father. 
It was out of the intimacy. He did everything that he did and said everything that he said. Brian and Jen. Um, who? Johnson, thank you. See, I need my daughter sometimes. <laughs> Brian and Jen Johnson years ago wrote a song called um, Where You Go, I'll Go. Yes. And the words are, where you go, I'll go. What you say, I'll say, God. Uh, what, what you pray, I'll pray. <coughs> that needs to be the theme of our life. And like Jesus, we need to be in the presence of the Father, hearing him. And hearing him, and not just hearing him, but communing with him, talking with him, finding out what his heart and his desire is. Why well, can't hear God? I quiet myself and I don't hear God. Listen a little closer. The word is nigh you. It's even in your mouth. Believe what one of the reasons my, my hardest thing to hearing the Lord when I started walking in this, and I didn't realize it at the time, my hardest thing was my head. Because I didn't hear my voice audibly talking. I didn't think I heard the Lord. And I had to lay that aside. I had to lay aside my understanding of how God should be doing this and let God do it his way. And when I finally got past my head and let God begin to speak through my spirit man into my heart, I began to hear things that my head tried to deny. I began to have a conversation within and I wasn't crazy, even though people think I am. It was a rational conversation with the Lord of all. And he began to tell me things, and I would obey. And as I did the things, it proved that I heard from the Lord. Well, God wants us to begin walking in that. It's time to become sons and daughters of the living God. It's time to walk as who we are. It's time to believe what scripture says, that God does live in you, that he is talking to you, that he, has, that he is communing with you, and it starts with gazing at him. If you look at him long enough, you're going to start seeing his lips move. Because when you stare at light, what happens? You stare up here at this light, you don't see anything. Because the light's so bright. And when we look away from it, what happens? We see the little spots around us. But if you keep staring at that light long enough, you begin to see the filament. Because your eyes adjust to the, to the luster of the light. But the reason we can't see and hear the Lord is because we look up and go, oh, it's too bright for me. Fix your eyes on him and eventually... The glory fades, not because the glory fades, but because my eyes are just the glory. And as I fix my eyes and I, folks, it takes practice. It takes time. Look at him, gaze at him, and eventually you'll begin to see his face. And trust me, when you see his face, you're going to look into the eyes of a love that you've never known before. And it will break you. Trust me, being in the Lord's presence isn't easy. The reality of who he is breaks everything about who you are. You will cry more than you've ever cried in your life. And I know I've talked to people, I've encouraged them to do this, and they come back to me, grown men. And they say, I've never cried. I cried like a baby all week long. I have men who, who, who have said, hey, I'm going to, I'm just going to listen to what the Lord is saying. And they put worship on and they begin to pray during their job. And they said, I had to actually stop and get alone because I, I, I couldn't do anything. I was just blubbering like a little baby. And they said, God, so bad I had to turn off the music and then start working because you will become undone. See, we cry out and say, God, I want this. God says, it's already yours. Just look at me. Just look at me. And, and the truth and reality, see, the, when I was a kid, I heard that song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, and it burned into my soul like nothing 
that I that I've ever heard before. Just the truth of that. If you just turn your eyes on Jesus and look full in his wonderful face, the things of this earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. God will outshine anything that seems important to you. And folk, I'm not just saying this as a rah rah shish ba, let's go church. It's real. The only reason we get depressed and we get down and we get we get struggling and everything else is because we take our eyes off the truth. And let me tell you, when you stare at that beauty and you stare at that glory long enough, everything else looks so drab and disgusting and boring. <laughs> and yet everybody else gets a thrill out of it. Walter warned us when he when he was mentoring us. He said, now, as you grow in the Lord, he said, be aware of one thing. Those things that once brought you a great thrill in this life lose their luster. He said, holidays, there were certain holidays that he used to love, Christmas, Thanksgiving, and others. He said, as he began to sit in the presence of the Lord and he began to commune with the Lord and see the Lord, he said, all of a sudden, he realized one year, there's something missing. And the Lord always released him around the holidays. He released him from his intercession and, his, and the work that he was doing so that he would be able to enjoy that time with his family. He said there was nothing that was more beautiful than being with the Lord. He said all of the, all of the luster and the glory and the glittery and the glitz of those holidays faded because of the time he spent with the Lord. And he said it wasn't a bad thing. He said he just saw it for what it was. And it took him a little bit of time to be able to adjust to enjoy it. But it never was the same enjoyment that he once had. But he couldn't wait to get back into the presence of the Lord because he saw something that none of us have ever seen. And God is inviting us to that. He's been calling us to that. And I just want to spend the last part of this class I want us to sit quietly and look at the Lord. Just quiet yourself and allow the Lord to bring you into his presence. And I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to open, open the heavens over us. Because God wants, God is inviting us to enter into a deeper relationship with him. And folks, if you really, really do this tonight, I promise some of you are going to see things you've never seen before. God has been longing to, re to reveal himself in ways to us, and I've been feeling this for weeks now. And God wants to begin to release that over us because this is his heart. But he needs us to take the time to actually look. And that's all he's asking tonight. Just look at me. You may not hear anything, but concentrate the eyes of your spirit. Man, not, I actually want you to close your physical eyes because they're going to distract you. Let the eyes of your spirit be opened by the Lord to see him. You might like to play your keyboard. I'll tell you when. I'll tap you. Actually, can you start with that? And then there will be a timer. We're going to let them go. So, yeah. Because I know it's easier for us to enter into the presence when there's worship going on. I'm, I'm going to let, I'm going to ask uh, um, Charles to, to just play for us a little bit. He has an anointing, a prophetic anointing on the, on the keyboard that is bar none. But I want you, don't concentrate on the music. I want you to focus on the Lord. The music is just there to help to bring your spirit, your soul to peace and to rest. But let the Lord, let the Lord begin to, to speak to you. Just listen to him. Father, I just want to ask you right now. Open the heavens above us. Lord, open your heart to your children. Lord, I ask right now 
that you would touch the spiritual eyes of every one of us in this room, everyone who's listening, and open our eyes, heal our blind eyes of our spirit man, that we can see you. Release to us the vision of heaven. Let us see you. Let us see you. Open up the heavens over this place. That there is nothing blocking us in your throne. Let us see you. Let us gaze on your beauty. I speak to the soul of every man and woman and child in this room and I say be still be still be in peace Thank you. 
Lord, we ask that you would keep us here always. Teach us to live in this place of rest. A rest and a peace that encompasses our spirit flows through into our soul, even brings our bodies to a place of peace. For here, O Lord, is life and life abundance. Thank you. 
that which you have longed for us to receive, as you've waited for just such a time as this. Lord, you have imparted to us gifts that you can use. I ask, Lord, that you ignite those gifts here in your presence. In your glory, in your throne. <coughs> Lord, there are gifts that you've been waiting to release to us, to your children. I ask you to release them tonight. Father, I pray for a peace that passes all understanding. I pray for your love to flow through us, even as we see it. May that love be indelibly stamped upon our hearts, our minds. Give us the mind of Christ. That when the world looks at us, Lord, they see what we see tonight in you. For Lord, this is not this is not the last night of the class. This is the first night of our walk. And Father, as you have given me understanding of things, I ask, Lord, you would release the understanding into your children. That, Lord, you would send forth all these. That as Moses, as they have gazed at your face tonight, as they have seen your glory, let that glory go with them. Let it shine as a luster around them. That when others look at them, they see you. They don't understand what it is, but they see you. Father, I ask that you would never allow our eyes to be shut again. Now teach us, Lord, to see through our spiritual eyes, through your eyes. Let us see the people whom you've allowed to harass us to persecute us, to bring us trouble. Let us see them as you see them. Let us love them as you love them. And Lord, as we close out this night, I pray for a revelation of your holiness. <clears throat> Here in your presence, we would know anew and afresh that you are holy. Burn it in our hearts, Lord. Cause your holiness to burn within us against everything that is unholy against everything that sets itself up, against the knowledge of you. Oh, 
fire when we consume the fire come consume us today. release to us a new understanding. What it means that you are our Lord. Lord, let us go forth from here tonight, carrying the two shamans. Stir the hunger and the flame, the desire within our spirit for more of you. Cause yourself. become more important than anything else. And teach us how to walk in this world, in this life that you've given us, in that understanding that every day, no matter what we're doing, it's all about you. Teach us how to walk in this now, Lord. How to walk with you in every moment of the day. Keep us attuned to your voice. Keep our eyes fixed on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. For Lord, you are worthy of everything we lay down. You are worthy of everything we give up. You are worthy of all of our obedience. You are worthy of everything that we count as loss. You are worthy of our bodies. You are worthy of our minds. You are worthy of our emotions. You are worthy of our spirits. You are worthy to dwell within our bodies as a living temple. You are worthy for us to love as you love. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy to receive the rewards of your suffering. Each and every one that sits here in this class, that listens to this night, you're worthy of us. Take what is yours, Lord. Give it to him. Lord, send us out wherever you would have us to go. But I ask you go with us.
that from this day forward, our lives become a walk in the spirit. That our lives be lived before your throne day and night. That nothing is too valuable for us to give to you. Nothing is too important. Make us a holy people set apart unto you. No matter what the cost. No matter what the cost. No matter what the cost. Because you're worthy of any cost. Please, Lord, grant this desire that we may stay in your temple. Gaze upon your glory. See your face. Know your heart. And waste our days and our strength upon you. Restore to the heart of your people the worth of your being. <clears throat> Let us arise and be <clears throat> a bride worthy of the one who gave it all. <clears throat> a bride worthy of the eternal king. Of the Lord of all lords, the God of all gods, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who was and is and is to come, a bride worthy of the Holy One. Father, when we leave this place, we ask that we will never leave this place. And I ask that you cause this so brief a moment before you to go with us all the days of our lives. That you would be glorified. In all you made us, that you would be glorified in all you allow for us, that you would be glorified in all that you want to do in and through us. That because of this night, because of this brief time in your presence, <clears throat> the world might be saved. You would receive the rewards of your suffering. <coughs> Remake us this night into your image. Reform our hearts to be like you. God, have you.
we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, if you practice that, start the end. This is only the beginning. Even if we never have another class, you have all of you know, it will be shown you tonight. That's all you need. And we look forward to seeing you in two weeks to we'll see what the Lord has. Anybody that's listening, I encourage you to be here. Um, I don't know what the word is going to be. Um, God bless you. Somebody can help us set these up. Yes, uh, bring, bring whatever food you want to bring. We don't regulate that. Just bring something to share with the body. God bless you all. June 3rd, Monday night, June 3rd. That's the last class. And again, maybe questions and answers. I don't know what the board's going to find out. God bless you. No, you don't have to bring food if you'd like to bring it. You know, it's not a requirement. I know a lot of people, there's been people over the years that say, I can't come because I can't bring anything. Please come and enjoy the fellowship and what the Lord has.